So the thing that's almost as exciting as seeing a leopard to me is watching and seeing this kind of magical um, success of ecotourism and uh, <clears throat> making the locals happy uh, with wild, that direct, relates directly for, to conservation. And I'm always critiquing places around the world, especially Asia. It's how do you make it work? You know, ecotourism can either kill a resource or it can save it from extinction. Um, and this is, this is basically the best example I've ever seen. There's no competition. It's everybody's working together. There's a team. Um, so what do you think, Bazad? Can you explain a little bit kind of what's going on and how this is working? Absolutely. So right now there's a snow leopard, um, most likely a female, but who knows, um, up on that peak over there. Uh, initially in the morning, um, one of the trackers uh, or two of the trackers had gone down to look at the blue sheep kill where the snow leopard was last spotted. They had seen the snow leopard just leaving it. And um, one of the trackers, Nalong, who's actually from the village of Rumbuk, and often works for us, but works for a lot of um, other companies as well. He's got his own guest in the national park and um, they're leaving actually day after tomorrow. So they've got very few days. But um, he, he sort of predicted that the leopard would um, go from that ridge behind and exit on this side of the mountain for some sun, um, obviously because um, it's south facing. So he came down over here, he found the leopard, he radioed our camp right away. He said, the leopard's here, um, please get my guests and bring your guests. We got here and on the way we radioed our own camp um, and we messaged our camp to go over to the next camp, um, a totally different company, and told them to also bring their guests over here. Because at the end of the day, this is everyone's snow leopard. It doesn't belong to the person who found it or you know, the guests who've hired the tracker that found it. It is, it is uh, you know, it, it's an Indian national park, but really it's the world's national park and it's the world's natural resource and everyone has the same right um, to see a snow leopard. So I think that it, it works in a really beautiful way that um, e even though you know we're all competing expeditions in terms of our um, marketing and our approach and our um, uh, jostling to get perhaps the same tourist dollars, um, in the end when guests are on the mountain, um, all the expeditions work together to make sure that all of our guests go back happy because you don't you don't want someone traveling from across the world and not getting a chance to see a snow leopard because um, someone's possessive about their guests seeing it first. Yeah, everybody's everybody's working together to make people happy, put a value on the snow leopards. They want them to be healthy. They want everyone to go home happy. Um, and then kind of share a profit to the village, something. So it's if so everybody succeeds, everybody's happy, right? One of the things that makes uh, Hemis National Park both a model for conservation and a model for community-based anti-poaching and community-based conservation is uh, this beautiful arrangement um, between the consumer and the residents of the park. What happens is that when you sign up for any snow leopard expedition that takes place within Hemis National Park, you are paying park fees. Park fees are 1,500 rupees per person per day. Um, any staff that is expedition staff that comes in, guides, cooks, porters, helpers, anything. If they are not park residents, um, if they're not from a village within the national park, they have to pay about 650 rupees per person per day. So our expedition pays um, fees for all of our guests, fees for me. Um, I, I get charged um, the normal 1500 per person per day rate. And um, almost all of our staff uh, is from within the park. Um, it makes financial sense, sure, because we're not paying the park fees, but it also builds um, this economic um, chain you know the snow leopard itself is then a prized source of livelihood it is uh, worthless really as a dead animal it's worthless as a pelt it's worthless uh, as anything else besides a beautiful majestic animal that's living its you know fullest life within the national park and so often um, uh, guests sort of think that they're saving money um, by staying outside of the national park but what really they're doing is they're just putting the income into um, one singular person's pockets or maybe uh, one family's pockets. What happens when you come and stay within Hemis National Park is that these uh, park fees, the 1500 rupees that each person is paying, is actually getting split um, except for five rupees, which goes to the park department. Everything goes into a pool, which is controlled by all, 
all the families, all the homes within like, Hemis National Park. Like dividends almost. So basically at the end of the year, um, you've had all these expeditions come and go. And each, each time they're paying this money and all of it's going into this one bank account. And at the end of the year, um, that money is spent on projects which are really important to the people within Hemis National Park. Primarily, they go towards fencing. The fencing goes up around fields. It goes up around um, anything uh, where there's livestock. They basically make corrals that are more efficient, more snow leopard proof, more Tibetan wolf proof. And uh, the fencing basically keep, keeps the ungulates out, keeps the blue sheep out, keeps the oriole out, keeps the Tibetan argali out. And um, what it does, it really reduces human wildlife conflict within the national park. And so it gives the snow leopard and the Tibetan wolf and the lynx a fighting chance um, at actually being able to control a whole ecosystem without really coming into contact in a negative way with the villagers in the park. And so you are in fact then choosing with your dollar um, where uh, you, you can, you're basically voting with your dollar. You're saying, I want to spend this money on snow leopard conservation, on Tibetan wolf conservation, on creating an ecosystem that is sustainable. Right. <clears throat> awesome. It's the best case scenario, really. It really is. Um, one of the other projects that they're working on this year is uh, connecting some of the villagers, um, villages, villages. <coughs> what they're really doing this year is connecting some of the villages to a <laughs> 10 megawatt, uh, sorry, 10 kilowatt solar power project. And uh, it's being paid for by the park fees. And so now, even better, they're not going to have to run a diesel generator every night to bring power to their homes and will be relatively self-sufficient. They already grow all their own crops. You know, they get whatever else they need from lay. Mm -hmm. And now uh, they're green. They're on solar power. So what could be better? Nope. <clears throat> and then they got healthy snow leopard population to pay them dividends and yep. they're living happy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so in, uh, in, the, in our previous expedition, we had seven sightings over a week. Mm -hmm. uh, in the current one, we've had really um, two sightings mm -hmm. uh, in a week, but you also managed to have fantastic Eurasian lynx uh, sightings. We saw a mother and a cub. Then we saw one um, male uh, woolly hare. Then uh, we've seen about seven Tibetan wolves and uh, we've seen a red fox. So all together it just indicates, you know, if you come over here for a week or 10 days, you're going to see something pretty phenomenal. Absolutely. And if you know, you spend the same time going to Mongolia or to Tibet, what you'll get is fantastic access to culture, uh, fantastic access to some incredible um, parts of the world, but your chances of seeing a snow leopard are much slimmer. <clears throat> yeah, and even if the animals are there, you're not gonna see them because it takes a uh, small army of the best spotters I've ever seen in my life in the wildlife industry working 12 hours a day as hard as I've seen any kind of naturalists work yep. to, to spot the hardest animal in the world to see. Absolutely. I mean, if you <coughs> just imagine this distance, what do you think it is? Like two and a half kilometers? Two, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. probably. Maybe two At miles least. even. I think, I would think yeah. two miles. Two miles. Yeah. So there's a, uh, you know, 100 pound cat sleeping on uh, what looks to be, you know, at least 4,800, 4,900 meter peak um, from two miles. So no joke. It's naturally camouflaged that's, for the landscape. That's built, that's built for this. <laughs> it's, just, it's just incredible. That's why they call it the mountain ghost. <laughs>